we are here. The Geek Speak Show covering WonderCon Anaheim 2014 in Anaheim. That's why it's in the title. Hi, Angel. Hey. So you can follow us, by the way. If you're not here, yeah, I know it's not it's not in San Francisco, but it's here. It's fun. We're here. We're going to cover for you. You can follow us. You're going to tweet pictures. I'm going to tweet pictures. The superheroes are here. Where? The, one of the cosplayers and ours, the superhero oh, okay. launch, they're here also. <laughs> e Squared, Albert Lawrence, he's here somewhere. David Glanz is over there doing interviews. Yep. We're going to do some with him, with everybody for you. Uh, you can follow our Twitter, at GeekSpeakShow1. At, at GeekSpeakAngel. Pictures, the superheroes, at, what is it? The Geek See, I want to keep calling it the one. Supper no. Lounge, but it's Oops. not that, because you can go there and get shawarma, but that's, that's, that's something else. That's outside the convention that? center. No, their Twitter is at the Super Lounge. Follow them there. They're going to do some interviews with, I think, some brand new TNT shows that we know nothing about. They're going to get the exclusive for you. I have one. What? TNT's Falling Skies. That's a good You're one. You're going to get the exclusive. I'm going to talk to some of the stars on there. Maybe, maybe, not promising anything. Of course I am. I got money in my pocket. You You'll do? get some spoilers. No. Oh, okay. That's I'm not going to touch it. I'm pocket. not going to touch it. I promise. So, again, the, uh, the Geek Speak show at WarnerCon Anaheim 2014. Ready? Yes. Let's go. Get your bag. Super. So, Doug, with Falling Skies, we're about to jump into your fourth season now coming mm -hmm. about. Paranoia seems to be a theme that just courses through the veins of the show. How does it hit you? Yeah, well, yeah, it hits Cochise different than it does the, the humans. You know, since I'm the, this cool, calm, collected alien on the show, I don't have quite those same frantic, paranoid issues that all the people do. Everybody goes crazy this year. No, I'm not, I'm not kidding you. Uh, in, season, in episode one, you're going to see everyone's isolated and separated from each other, and, 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 and months have set in, and that what happens to a person when they don't have their peeps around them, uh, you'll see different colors of their characters come out. So the humans are going nuts. They're all going nuts. What I love about being Cochise is that I'm still the calm collected everything's fine everything will be fine uh, uh, character uh, but but I'm also kind of isolated in my own way uh, my mothership my dad uh, the who landed and, and we're, we're here to fight off the issue any of things will be fine now well Episode one's going through uh, here in uh, season four, and you're going to be like, well, where are these Volm? Where are the Volm? Where are the Volm? They're supposed to be fighting some people. Uh, uh, bad is happening, and the Volm aren't here to, to fix it. So what's wrong? Where are they? So that's the question that's going to remain for most of the episode until I make my appearance. And I'll, and I'll explain, hey, listen, we have other battles going on in the universe. It's not just Earth. You people, just stop being so egocentric, okay? Uh, and so uh, dad and the mothership are gone, uh, but what's left is, um, is my small recon team, and we're just kind of infor giving information back to the, hoping to trying to keep things uh, even keeled while, uh, while my dad and the, and the Volm gang are gone. So will they come back? Uh, uh, you have to watch the entire season to find this one out, okay? It's because uh, it's going down. Okay, it's going to yeah, but literally but, gravity is bringing yeah, it down. Yeah, everything down. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So with all of that, uh, we've got one final question for you too. So the technology that mm -hmm. happens within the show that you get an opportunity to play with. Yeah. What's been your favorite piece, your favorite toy, if you will? <laughs> well, uh, yeah, right, right. well, because I, I have gadgets. I, I come, I come bearing gadgets. I'm an alien. Well, what do I? I have to have gadgets. Um, but what I kind of love is uh, there's a, there's a communication device. Uh, that's sort of like an iPad, but it's got but it's got this scrolly bits around the edges that looks like an alien made it. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I got my alien <laughs> iPad, um, and so that's kind of my communicator. That so, but I can't find it for most of the season. So at some point in the in the show, you'll see like I get my my Volm pad back, and I can finally talk to the mothership. Finally, we've been out of communication with them too. So I'm 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 feeling my own sense of isolation because I'm also kind of abandoned by, by the mothership and the humans are all you know isolated from each other because they're held in captivity in different places as episode one unfolds. So, uh, so uh, there's a sort of a human alien parallel between me and, and, the, uh, and the people on the show. Yeah. yeah isolation is a strong it's, theme it's right a there. theme Perfect. and, and what happens in that isolation, character colors come out of people when they're uh, not around their, their, their support system. Super. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. So we're here with Boom Blooded from Falling Skies, TNT's Falling Skies. Uh, we're not going to get into spoilery territory unless you want to. So tell us a little bit what we can expect in the upcoming season. Um, this season starts off where we're all together. We've been united for about, or reunited for about four months, and then we all get separated, and all the characters that are normally together are, um, they're with new characters or with different characters. And uh, we all try to find our way back together. Um, and there's, you know, same as always, there's a lot of sci-fi. There's a new character, my daughter. Um, not new, but she is 
much older now and and we're trying to figure out where her allegiance is and, and lots of good stuff like that. Yeah, so, so this show in the beginning you guys were just together and, and you know, when you were surviving then you were out all over the place now it sounds like you're gonna be back together again as actors which, which do you prefer when, when the cast is all together doing the scenes or when everybody's off on their own? I think it's great when any year when they just change it up so uh, having scenes where we can have either new characters or with different ones always makes it much more exciting and um, there's always new aliens you know usually being introduced but uh, this year we have a lot of different themes we've got Maxim Knight who is now in like a youth camp we've got me I'm now a soldier and I'm not so much being a doctor and we've got um, so many different storylines that are sort of coexisting so it's it's gonna be an exciting year so which do you like doing doing better helping people or shooting people shooting people come on now <laughs> That's yeah, way more fun to play. Yeah. Gun or stethoscope? I'll take the gun. Yeah, so it would be. So Moonblug again from TNT's Falling Skies. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Three, two, fun. All right. So Sarah, you said that you wanted to get deep while talking about Falling I Skies did. right now. You go. You take the shovel. This is all yours right I now. I always get too deep when I talk about <laughs> Maggie. She's in there, man. <laughs> And it gets it gets so complicated this season. You guys can't even imagine. You will you cannot fathom. Help us imagine. <laughs> Fill in some of those chasms of curiosity for us. Okay, so Hal and Maggie obviously leave on tough terms, but let me tell you that Karen is the least of the problems for Hal, Hal and Maggie in season four. Yeah, um, and there is a love triangle. There's a love triangle. Those work out yeah, great in classic are. literature. We're and going right and, there, yeah. my, my heart's starting to beat really <laughs> fast. Um, well, no, we dealt with the love triangle in season three. And, you know, Hal was obviously, he was, there's one way of looking at it, which is that he, he gets the um, better end of the stick in that love triangle. And Maggie did a lot to accept, you know, the position that he was putting her in. And Hal loves Maggie. I mean... Yeah, Hal loves Maggie. Maggie loves Hal. There's a lot of real going on in that relationship that's not going anywhere. However, it is challenged. And um, ben. Ben. Oh, ben. Ben, oh, ben falls in love <laughs> with Maggie. And then things happen. And uh, it's justified, but it still happens. And I think for Maggie, because she's been betrayed so much in her life by people, by Hal, um, and also by life itself, uh, she has a lot of uh, pain around the idea that her own integrity could be compromised, like to, to be the betrayer. I have found playing Maggie, she's, this character's taught me so much, but to be the betrayer is far more painful um, because you're dealing with uh, shame and confusion and see, we got deep. Sorry, there we you did, we go. did get deep. In a very short period of time. Just in time. They, they right? could feel that you were going to dig know. a little deeper. That's how we had to wrap this yeah. on up. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Sarah. We're, like, there's so much to look forward to in June, clearly, for us with Falling it's Skies. Nuts, man. It's, it's insane. So here you are at the TNT Falling Skies panel with Seychelles Gabriel. Now, tell us without spoilers, or if you want to, you can. <laughs> What can we expect from your character and from the upcoming season? Uh, my character, Lourdes, goes back a lot to her faith this season, just to get right to the point. Um, her, after the eye bugs last season and the terrible, terrible harm that she has done to everybody, um, she kind of comes back with this um, enlightened spirituality that's really, really driven almost to... Uh, diluted fanatical sense to 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 being peaceful and and, and doing good, doing no harm. <laughs> That's kind of scaring the viewers because we love seeing you in the action scenes. Does that mean you're not going to have a lot of action scenes this summer? Um, not a ton, but it's it does get really intense um, individually between characters, especially with Lourdes and the way that she speaks about what she believes and and stuff. You were here last year at WonderCon also. You didn't give away who the mole was at the time. Um, not saying anything, but is there anything that, well, it'll be kind of spoiler, that, that you can say about the character where it's going to go after now that we know? Not really. <laughs> um, 
Uh, she's just a lot different. Um, the way she speaks, the way she dresses, the way she carries herself, I think is um, is altered in a in a weird spiritual. I don't know. Almost sometimes seems like. I don't want to say hypnotized, but like, she, you know, she's just on her path and that's all she sees right now. So you guys will see that when it premieres, TNT's Falling Skies coming on June 22nd. Thanks, so. Thank you so much. Karaoke night outside the arena at WonderCon Anaheim 2014. Look who I have here from the Geek Speak Network. It is the loungers. Hey, hey, we're back. What's up? This is what we look like. <laughs> look at it. But us. listen anyway. Look at us. Sonny is the new guy. You can Hello. you can tell because Hello. he actually my, thinks his mic works. My doesn't mic have doesn't a cable. Work. This doesn't work. So anyway, it's, it's day one it's of prop. WonderCon. What are you what are you guys looking forward to? I'm looking forward to Son of Batman. I heard that's going to premiere tonight, and I'm excited for that. Son of Batman, Legends is going to look. Oh yeah, Legends. 20th Century Fox, How to Train Your Dragon. Yep. Oh, two. Uh, Dawn of Planet of the Apes. I'm looking forward to the Planet of the Apes thing. Yeah. This is I don't know Godzilla. The Godzilla panel. Godzilla. Wait, wait, wait. You're, you're our X-Men guy. You're not looking forward to X-Men. Was there an X-Men panel? There's yeah, suppose, There's one scheduled. There's X-Men panel. Brian Singer's going to be there. Really? Yeah. And then I need to be there. I need yeah, to be there. Yeah. So we're all going to be there. You're all going to be there. If you're not here, you can watch it through us. Hear it here on the Geek Speak Show on their Superheroes <laughs> Lounge. That, they're the easy one. You can just lounge and all that. The when are you guys going to do a new lounge. episode? Friday, a couple this Fridays. This Friday, there will be Friday. a new episode. We're going to talk about superheroes and uh, vacations. Vacation vacations, plans. Because we've been taking a break. It's, uh, superheroes got to take a break. We're getting our son. They got to get their son. You get my son. Because yeah. nothing Candy's says vacation like superheroes. So the Geek <laughs> Speak <laughs> Show, <laughs> Superheroes <laughs> Lounge at WonderCon Anaheim 2014. Let's go catch Let's go. Brian Singh. Sure. Um, so Legends is a um, is a show about uh, a special group of FBI agents who um, who handle covert investigations. Um, a legend is a you know a uh, um, an identity that is created by an undercover agent to um, uh, to help infiltrate, go undercover. Um, but it's actually a, a fully, deeply imagined life. Um, and uh, Martin Odom, who Sean plays, is really sort of the best of the best. And these guys, just as a division, are, are really sort of the tip of the spear in doing investigative work uh, within the FBI. And uh, the show itself, that's the arena. The show itself is, is basically, it's about a guy who can't tell his legends from his real life. And um, these questions of his identity are really the sort of driving mythology of the show. And um, yeah, I'm, I can go on. Uh, oh yeah, so everybody's character. Um, okay, so I'll start with Sean. Sean uh, uh, plays Martin Odom, if that is his real name. Uh, and uh, and. Uh, uh, Sean is an FBI agent who works legends, who works undercover. He does deep cover infiltration. Uh, and in the pilot, um, somebody comes up to him and says, basically, Martin Odom uh, is a legend. It's not your, who you really are. And this launches uh, Martin on a deep quest uh, to discover what may actually be happening in his life uh, and who he really is. If there is some grand conspiracy a foot uh, behind this, he's going to get to the bottom. Uh, and in the Division of Covert Operations, which is a, a special elite division in the FBI, uh, his handler, or sort of the person who, uh, who sort of runs the operations for, uh, for Martin Odom, is uh, uh, Allie's character, Crystal McGuire, Special Agent Crystal McGuire. And, um, and there is a, there's a little bit of a history between them. There is a, uh, uh, some degree of tension uh, between them in terms of tactics and methods. And, uh, but together, they make a formidable team. And uh, they are supported and backed up uh, by Tina, who plays Maggie. I think it's Maggie Poole. <laughs> Maggie in the script. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Maggie is a, um, you know, trained on every database you can imagine. 
uh, NSA, um, DOD, FBI, uh, all of that, and is instrumental in sort of creating the deep backstory of, um, of these legends, and uh, which becomes absolutely instrumental in, um, in many times saving Martin's life. Um, I have a question for Sean. I was wondering, like, why do you always die in everything you're in? <laughs> I think I'm still alive in this one. Yeah, we'll, uh, uh, are you happy to be... Any, you... any plans for Sean's character's death? Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah, I don't die a lot. <laughs> Cool, so, hi Ali. Hi. How's it going? Welcome to WonderCon. Is this your first WonderCon? Is it time or the one in San Francisco? Well, there was a WonderCon yes, in San Francisco. Yes, I've been to that one, so this is not my first WonderCon. We're actually from San Francisco. Oh, okay. Well, welcome down. Thanks, and then you look fabulous. We, we want to know, since we're the Geek Speak show, we obviously want to know about the fashion, and we have to ask you, what are you wearing today? I'm wearing Valentino. I thought WonderCon, you know, could handle it. You know? She's spicing it up. Bringing Ooh. a little lady to the day. So are you excited about the show, Legends? I'm so excited. I mean, you know, when I first heard about the show, I had some great conversations with Howard Gordon, and he really won me over by talking about, you know, really when you think about the show, it's about who am I, and kind of delving into the psychological toll it takes on these agents that embed themselves, and you create these legends. But then you have to go home at night, and how do you wash that off? What happens to you in the darkness of the night? And, you know, what do you sacrifice? You know, Chris McGuire, she doesn't have a family. She doesn't have any children, you know? And that puts her in a place where she can be fearless, reckless. She's got nothing that holds her back. But at the same time, you know, I think it's crippling. Um, so I think that it's really interesting to kind of understand what goes into creating a woman like this. And... Um, you know, wanting to be in there with the guys, giving up. There's, there's no personal life. There's, there's no f time for friends. It's about, um, you know, her thrill and her drive comes from being able to, you know, be in duty. So definitely great. So uh, that should be it. And yeah. thanks for right, talking to us. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Bye -bye. Nice to meet you. So. All right. So we're just gonna walk around, show you guys how crowded uh, WonderCon Anaheim is, and we're gonna get into the mix. I'll try to narrate what we're seeing. I'm seeing a bunch of, uh, there's a tall guy. He's wearing a big cape. We got him, he's over there, leather jacket. Storm Shadow, oh, we got Storm Shadow. Oh, but I, I have to put on the, I have to put on the, the my, my, my gloves and my, my hood, and by, by that time, everybody's gone. You so, know, nobody wants to take a picture of me. You know you're, you're like Drizzle, Drizzle Shadow then. You're, I'm Drizzle Shadow, yeah. <laughs> no. This is going to be on the yeah on YouTube for the Geek Speak Show, the GeekSpeakShow.com. Oh okay, this is cool. I I got I'm kind of late. I got to go to a panel at 2:30. Nice hey, meeting you. Nice to meet you too. Did you see his watch? He has like a Rolex on him. <laughs> Storm Shadow. There you go. So we're walking around and you never know who we're gonna meet. Who was that guy? <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> that Storm Shadow needs to retire because he's getting a little old. And here we go. We got a couple people wearing some uh, some blue. What do you guys? Where's your wings? Wings? Uh, I, I haven't drank. I haven't drank my Red Bull today. So. Yes, yeah, no Red Bull today. Thanks, guys, for talking to us. Geekspeakshow.com. Find us on the internet. <laughs> so, yeah, you learn something new every day. Aquabats. <laughs> Someone tell me what an Aquabat is. <laughs> Keep us going. How you guys doing? You guys doing good? Yeah. First WonderCon. Yeah, first WonderCon for us. Welcome to WonderCon Anaheim, guys. Thank you. All right. People are just so friendly at WonderCon. People. Are just you know what I mean? I like this. We got we got Vegeta over here. What's uh what's my power level right now? Nine thousand. Just below nine thousand. Okay. Need a charge. And that's what that's what people do at WonderCon. I I love the energy. What's <laughs> up, guys? How's it going? We got Doctor Who. What are you eating over here? Doctor loves the barbecue. So, what year are you in right now? I'm not the doctor. Oh, he's not the oh, doctor. Oh my! Man. Is he feeling the feet? Let's film his feet real quick. And this is what the this is what the face of a uh, surprise and motive looks like. Because I didn't know what he was, but 
Thanks for talking to us. The Geek Speak Show. Frodo enjoying his barbecue. Let's keep going. We got a couple. Halo, 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 Halo. <laughs> What's up, Harley? What's up? How's it going, guys? How's it going? A little crowded. It was a little embarrassing earlier, but we're going to keep going. Show, and this is what we do on live TV. Wonder Woman. You're looking wonderful, woman. Whoa, this guy needs to get some sun over there. Get some sun. Get some sun. <laughs> he needs to get some sun. <laughs> so pale. So pale. I mean, we're in, sun we're in sunny Southern California. This is Anaheim. All right, let's keep going. Let's go into the mix. Looks like there's like some DC thing going on over there. There's multiple Jokers and a couple Batmen. No Batwoman. Well, there's a Batwoman mixed with the Joker. You got one guy with a boombox. I believe he's supposed to be from uh, Batman, 1990s Batman. Remember with Michael Keaton. All right, let's keep going. We'll just check out what's going on at the WonderCon. Why do you tell me that guy looked like Doctor Who? That was Frodo. <laughs> Yeah, his girl looked like Frodo. <laughs> no, 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 that's messed up. <laughs> so let's keep, let's keep walking. I like this guy's costume right here. Jesus bore our sins. He's a, how's it going? Get out of hell for free card. That's what we're doing. No, it, oh, that's when I go there. When yeah, I go there. When, when we go there. When the show goes there. <laughs> we're, gonna, we're out of jail for free. How's it going, everybody? And, uh... So now, this is the food portion of WonderCon. So if you're hungry and you're wondering, where can I get something that isn't a $32 fried chicken meal from across the street? <laughs> you can always go here and the food trucks is where the real, the real gourmet food is at. You can taste it in the air. And in your wallet, you can taste it. <laughs> so let's, let's go check it out what we got. We got Burger Monster. The prices are horrific. <laughs> <laughs> Latin Bistro, eh? Line's short over there. Maybe we should check that one out. And uh, we got... Who do we have? Chunkin' Chips. We got chocolate chip cookies. Because, you know, all the geeks out there love milk and cookies in the hot Anaheim weather. <laughs> Let's keep walking. Get it into the mix. If you go look behind me, we can see the... Uh, WonderCon! Anaheim! <laughs> you didn't get my kick? Fwaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaa
All right, so we'll keep walking. We'll keep recording. You never know what we're gonna see. What do we got here? We got Chopped Champion. They do. They were seen in the Food Network actually. And uh, we got Funky Garlic Fries, which you don't. You, you do want to eat it, but you don't want to eat it. Here we are, WonderCon again, and you never know who you're gonna run into. Hello. Get a load of her. You got change for a 20. <laughs> what? I heard that. <laughs> I heard that. <laughs> I have a string to put them in. What is this? <laughs> no. Change for a 20. I'm not an idiot. Yeah. Sure. All right, let's go before we get beat up. <laughs> we're here at WonderCon. We're here, at, uh, we're here outside just by the food trucks. Just, uh, you know, you never. We'll just stop by someone random. Excuse me. How's it going? Hi. How are you doing? Do you mind if uh, we interview for a little bit? Uh, sure. How are you enjoying your WonderCon? Good. I, I, this is amazing. This is the first time I'm here, but I'm loving it. Um, I've been to San Diego Comic Con twice, um, but this is my first time here, and, and it's amazing. Yeah. And uh, what was your name? Sorry. Uh, my name is Jose Arana. Jose Arana. And uh, what are you doing? What do you? What brought you to WonderCon? Um, honestly, I. I'm trying to get into the world of comics because I'm new to it. I've been in it with, like for like three years now, two years. I mean, there's people here that have done it for like their whole lives. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I'm learning a lot from them, um, and I'm actually creating a web comic. Um, yeah, and um, it's cool because it's such a welcoming community. And even though I'm I'm new to it compared to other people, um, you know, I'm learning a lot from them, and they're always there to like give advice or like. Uh, point you in the right direction for like comics that might interest you nice. um, and uh, well, well, why don't you tell me more about this webcomic that you are yeah yeah, yeah. so um, the webcomic is called Chronicles of a Necromancer um, and it involves fantasy and magic and Greek mythology and um, you can find it on my website chronicles of a um, yeah and um, <laughs> and uh, so it's about this female college student who discovers she's a necromancer and um, you're gonna find out later on that she's somehow tied to the Greek gods in some kind of way. Um, so yeah. Are you, writing, are you writing the story? Are you doing the illustration too and everything? So what I'm doing is uh, I'm creating the world and I'm writing it. Um, and I hired an artist who's in the UK. His name's Glenn Jones. He's amazing. And uh, check him out. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so he does the artwork for the comic. Well, that's very awesome. Look at look who, that's so random. We just ran into Jose. He's got a cool web comic. You should check it out. Chroniclesofanecromancer.com. Jose, lovely meeting you. Have a great WonderCon. All right, let's head out of here, guys. Okay, so the last ship. You said that you were able to get some serious cooperation with the U.S. Navy. What is it about this show that you think appealed to that force so much? To the Navy? Yeah. I think the show is, is not cynical. Mm. And it's, it's a show about heroes, but it's not also a show that's out to pr promote sort of like rah-rah jingoistic America. It's just about hardworking, honest people who make mistakes, who are human, but ultimately want to do the right thing. And I think because the show sort of respects the tenets of honor, courage, and commitment yeah, that the Navy themselves want to put forth, they were eager to let us work with them because that's how they believe every day. So I spent a lot of time, and Hank did, on the ships talking to real sailors saying, okay, look, you're at your station, this happens, what do you do? And they give me their answer and I write it down and I try to find a way to incorporate it into my drama so I get the real way they do it. It's always more interesting than what you think it could be because it's way cooler when the, what the hell the real guys do it. And that that was all we up to. Two knuckleheads are screwing up. You can't fire them. There's nowhere to go. The world's over. You can't demote them. There's no there's no navy. How do you keep them with the in the program motivated? So this is a question of leadership. He says, well, I would say the following, and he would t he'd lay it out for you, but, but teaching them their responsibility to their shipmates. How it's not just about them. It's about their their shipmates. About it's about the mission, and it's about lifting up all of us and, and making them believe that. And we did that in the show and it really it made this, ca this captain such an amazing hero. The kind of hero you, you, you want to put him up there with like, you know, Captain Kirk or Coach Taylor. You know what I mean? He's, he's a real leader. And so much of the Navy is about leadership, but it's not leadership from the top down. It's about 
command as service, leading, leading up. So you see a young sailor, even not during an apocalypse, you know, and you say, <laughs> even you see a young sailor, you seem to have a lot of potential. What do you want to do in the Navy, son, or, or, or young lady? Let me help you get there. Let me help you learn this department and that department. Let me send you to school for two years to become a doctor or engineer on the Navy's dime. Come back and bring that skill back to the Navy and show other people how you do it. And the greatest leaders are the ones who had the greatest mentors. And so we do a lot of meditating on the idea of leadership, which I think is why the Navy was so excited to work with us. And I think we also show the Navy being really badass because they do some pretty cool things. You know, It's been a long time since Top Gun, and the technology has gotten even better. So these guys can, they could shoot a bird out of the sky, not that they would, they could shoot a bird out of the sky from 15 miles away, boom, you know. Um, but their mission mostly is peace, you know, and, um, and they're part of the Constitution. The Constitution doesn't call for a standing army. It calls for a standing Navy, because we're an island nation in many ways. And they are our emissaries to the world. They are our ambassadors to the world. They're out all the time, forward. There are forward operating bases. So they want to be shown in a good light, they didn't tell us, you don't get our cooperation unless you show us in a good light. They just said, it looks like you're showing us in a good light. We want to be part of this. Right. And so they've been great. They've been part of our show every, from the very beginning. They give us notes. And, you know, look, I had never been to sea before, so it was always good to have a real person explain to me that you don't yell duck. You, you do something, you know, whatever. So, um, you know, for your geeks out there, it's like it's all about the research. This was a great a chance to do research with the Navy and learn how they how the ship works, and it's the most incredible, incredible piece of machinery. Well, so the final question, then, because I know we have to wrap you up, is you speak a lot about leadership. So I want to know what are some of the classical works. So whether you were looking at something from Socrates or like some old Machiavellian things, right. what which ones of those sort of inspirations right. have found them what have found themselves into right. this script? I read a lot of von Clausewitz on on war. I read a bunch of the sort of art of wars, okay. Machiavelli's and, La, and uh, Sun Tzu. But actually, one of the greatest pieces of material I read was uh, Command at Sea which is a, a book the Navy gives out to their commanders who are in the pipeline to become a leader one day. They pick you out. They say, you, I think you have what it takes to lead a ship one day. They pull you out. They put you in a, what they call the pipeline, and they take you to certain schools, and they train you. And, and people wash out. Not everyone's called to be a captain. As ship, your character, we know that uh, you said that you're, you don't consider yourself necessarily to be a hero within the show, but why is that? Uh, because I think that's the attitude of the man that I'm playing. Like, he doesn't put himself in the situation. He puts people before him. So he uses himself in the service of everyone else on the ship. So let's say you have a function on the ship, a very important job on the ship. One of the things I'm going to do is make sure that you are okay to do your job. You know what I mean? So therefore, that's why I said earlier that I help people be heroic rather than being heroic. But that can be looked at as heroic. It's just a matter of perspective, you know? Well, in developing that character then, was there any specific person on the ship or any, excuse me, was there anybody within the Navy that you spoke with that you were able to really draw upon for that sort of attitude and that sort of self-sacrifice? Yeah, the very first day, I was able to meet the actual master chief of the ship. The very first day, our very first day of rehearsal, we lined up in a, we went to the lunch room on the naval base in San Diego. We were all sat down and then in the room walks all of our real life counterparts from the ship. So the actual Master Chief sits across from me and he takes me, well first we have lunch together, just kind of get to know each other. He takes me on the ship and he takes me through, you know how somebody says, I'm gonna take you through my Los Angeles or whatever. So he takes me through his ship, you know, like these are the things that I focus on. These are the things that are important to me on the ship. So we had a whole day of that. And then the next day he was just there for me. He followed me around and just questions anything. I, If I wanted to know what a button did, what a, this how you what happens when you flip this switch anything he was just there for me um so that helped me really absorb things because he was just kind of there and that's which is why i answered the first question that way because that's what he did for me he just kind of was there he was just like i'm here you know what do you need from me so well then how curious were you and how much did you take him up on that offer to tell you which each and every button man oh, everything i passed i asked him what it was and he i was testing his patience and there was no there was no limit there was no, and it but it taught me everything because I was consciously going, okay, how much do I take from people? And he took everything I had. And his, you know, he never, you know, it never boiled up here. Just everything was composed and he kept it, you know, kind of in the middle. Because he, he's the center of the ship in a lot of ways because he's the chaplain, the counselor, parents for some people, because there's a lot of young people on the ship, you know, 18, 19, 20 year olds, and they're missing. They're missing home, missing their wife, 
They got it. You know, they're depressed. All those things. Those are all the things that I deal with to help keep them, keep their morale up, and keep, thus keep the ship functioning. Wow. Okay. See, you don't even have time to be a hero then because it's too busy yeah, keeping it together. Myself, I feel yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much for spending some time with us. Okay, so with the last ship, we know that there are so many different character dynamics that we'll get a chance to explore within the pilot and throughout the show. But for you, between the themes of isolation and of brotherhood, camaraderie, things that happen on the ship, what do you think is a stronger theme that occurs in the show? Well, you know what? The isolation plays into the brotherhood for sure. And I know my character goes through a lot of turmoil throughout the season. Um, you know, this virus is a very deadly thing. And you know, I might lose a few people along the way, and it's, it's how do we stay tight and stay together when you might have a limited amount of, of people that are qualified as me. So maybe there's, there's times where you, know, you got to pull someone up, teach them how to do things. So, so brotherhood is a huge aspect of this. And in the military, I mean, it's all about brotherhood and camaraderie. That's one of the main components, and I think that's why it's such a beautiful show is because it really taps into thing in, in humanity is that brotherhood, is those relationships and the connection that's established. And the isolation, it just, it, it just accentuates that completely. Yeah. And then along with that then, as, since the isolation really intensifies things as well, there has to be some time for release. So what did you guys do in order to break the tension after having such heavy things to deal with on the ship? As an actor or as a character? Uh, let's do as an okay. actor. As an actor. <laughs> so as, as not my character. Right, right, right. Absolutely. Oh, shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. So for me, I mean, going home, and, and uh, this, this definitely was, you're, you're dealing with extraordinary circumstances of, you know, you're facing, you know, humanity's facing extinction, and, like, you're, you're thinking about these things of, of, like, who's alive, who's not alive. We have limited information. And you start thinking about just who we are as a people when there's no government, when there's no police, when there's, there's really no rules. Who do we become? So, I mean, there's just, it's a pretty heavy, I mean, this is not just a light day on a set. So, um... I mean, for me, I'd have to continue doing my, my own thing. You know, me and my buddies, we hang out. I, I went skydiving a few times to release some tension. Um, I did some, a lot of Muay Thai. I started working out at Brit CrossFit, so I was doing CrossFit workouts. And then, you know, just, just kicking it, going on weekend vacations, whether it's the Joshua Tree or, or whether it's just getting away, you know. No sailing. No sailing. <laughs> Enough of that shit. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Well, thank you so much. We look forward to the premiere. Geek Speak Show, Son of Batman. Plenty of people coming through. We're going to talk about Batman's son, Damien. We're going to see what this movie is about because we're figuring it out and learning it right here on the Carpet Live. So we're going to bring you along with us on this journey. Son of Batman. With Jason Amara, our voice of Batman and son of Batman. This is your second time donning the, the cowl, if you will. So coming at it this time, what did you bring with you that you already learned the first time when you did Justice League? experience. I think the hardest thing about voicing Batman for the first time was trying to find the sound of you know how how the guy himself should sound but also how to produce that sound and how Batman and Bruce Wayne differ slightly. So I found that quite tough on Justice League War. I mean I, I was fairly happy at the end with what we produced but this gave me another you know, a second crack at it. It gave me another crack of the whip and, and it was a chance for me to kind of really hone in on what I wanted to improve and, and even start to enjoy myself. And Go figure. Yeah, and that's, that's why I love this movie, because I just I had a great time uh, working on it. Well, then, you have to break down for us, then, some of the differences between voicing Bruce Wayne and voicing Batman, and how do you make that shift? Well, I mean, obviously, Batman is uh, he's, he's darker. He's, I think, the embodiment of... Um, uh, what Bruce Wayne is setting out to do, you know, setting out to achieve. Um, so Bruce himself, I think there's a, a responsibility that Bruce has to be fairly charismatic uh, for the board, uh, for his business, for all of the things that Bruce does for Gotham. So he has to be pretty well put together and um, pretty presentable. Whereas Batman doesn't need any of those things, so um, it, it was it was kind of fun to play with the differences there. Although I have to say that I don't think there were a huge amount of I don't think there was a huge contrast. I didn't want there to be a startling contrast. Oh, yeah, it's still the same guy, but one is a guy that's willing to 
pleas publicly, and the other guy is private and he's just out to intimidate you. Gotcha. So then speaking of intimidation, it can be completely intimidating being the son of Batman and jumping into the family business, if you will, it's a, it's a, with crime fighting. Did any of those themes resonate for you or resonate with, with you and your family? Did you think about what that would mean to, to, to train a child to follow in your exact footsteps? I think the trick as a parent is to try to guide your kid. Um, and if he has any, uh, you know, natural aptitude for for stuff, whether it's for sports or something else, you're trying to guide those energies and channel them into, you know, positive things and uh, uh, things that have a positive outcome. You know, uh, like doing stuff for other people or or trying to be the best. Uh, you know, playing on a team or whatever it is. Um, so yeah, I mean, obviously this is an extreme situation where Damien has been trained by the League of Assassins, and uh, he has some, you know, pretty uh, dangerous ninja skills that Batman is desperately trying to stay on top of. He doesn't want to get into a fight with him, but at the same time, he's trying to teach him how to use these powers for good. And um, you know, that's that's kind of what you hope uh, you get in the end. And pouring that on top of adolescence, it's it's, it's a crazy mixture. Yeah, 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 it's a crazy yeah. mix. And also, it's it's not a particularly happy uh, family story, so yeah, yeah, yeah. he's got to get his head around that stuff, too. But you know what? Batman's showing up, and he's being a dad, and he's doing the best he can. So. I like that. This, this is quite the family portrait that you have behind you right here, too. Yeah. Great. It's kind of like me and my son at home, relaxing, <laughs> just, uh, you know, shooting through the air. Um, that's him Sorry, there. Man. Yeah, he's a little pissed. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time, Jay. Batman to life. How intimidating does it feel? Um, it's it's a pretty big legacy. So you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of pressure on it, obviously. But um, you know, I, I like, I'm kind of you know more uh, smooth, go with the flow, guy. So you know, I you know I always want to be serious about things, but you know, you can't be too serious because otherwise you're gonna screw up eventually. <laughs> yeah. So you know, you gotta you gotta uh, have your own little playfulness to it. You know, and bring yourself into the character, and that's how you that's how you make legacies. You know. Yeah. That's right. Now speaking of legacy. I mean, you're, you're a part of a huge legacy now, as you already know this. So looking at this poster, what are some of the things that jump out to you that really get you excited about seeing this movie? Uh, there are many things uh, that get me excited, uh, excited about it. Uh, first of all, you know, me right there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that's obvious, that's obvious. <laughs> yeah, me right beside Batman. But um, also, you know, the fact that, you know, um, you know, the, you know, the, uh, you know, the sly look in his eye. You know, the, you know, it's very, you know, it, you can obviously you know, uh, get the feeling from him that, you know, he's, he's been trained by assassins, you know. He's a very, he's a very tough guy, but you know he's also, um, you know, yes, yeah, yes, you know he's a very, he's a very tough guy. Um, he's very smart. Um, it, that's what really gets me excited about it because uh, sometimes I can actually uh, relate to him as well. Yeah, um, I relate to him through uh, smarts. Although there is one thing that uh, he, uh, I think he has an F in manners. <laughs> yeah, he has to work on that. But um, he also, I also relate to him through uh, martial arts. Uh, I'm a, uh, I'm a Taekwondo uh, black belt candidate. You know, I know, uh, I know swords. I know nunchucks. I know, uh, I know staff. I know, I know lots of things. In fact, um, maybe I could try to show you a little kick or two, uh, really quick. Uh, here. Um. Yeah. That's the son of Batman right there showing us how to do it. <laughs> Assassin in motion. <laughs> Congratulations once again, and thank you for pointing those things out. Like that, that glare in his eyes is quite crazy, right? There's some crazy in him. Yeah, you could tell that he has, a, you know, a goal. You know, you know, he always wants. You know, you could tell what he wants, definitely. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it, and we look forward to seeing you on the screen, man. Thanks. Alex. All right. Cool, cool, cool. All right. And I think you guys want him next, right? Sure. Of course, you're in demand here. <laughs> So we've got Sean, the voice of Nightwing within Son of Batman. Sean, you're sipping on something right now, but your first day when you showed up to voice Nightwing, was there any sort of herbal tea or any water? What do you keep with you to keep the voice fresh? Um, you know, it's it's a good question because it was actually the first time I, that I've ever voiced a character is this movie, and I was so uh, I had all of my throat coat teas and my everything, um, you know, because I sang, but I had never done voiceover work, so I was uh, terrified. But Andrea um, was extraordinary and um, took really good care of me. You know what? The most interesting thing is is that they keep green apple slices. Because sometimes when you're, like when you hear that, like when you're talking and you can hear like a little spit in people's mouths when their mouth is dry, the green apple slices takes that away. So I was sort of fascinated by that. There's this amazing trick to keep your mouth dry, or mouth 
moist. Yeah. Moist. Okay. Moist. When your mouth is dry, <laughs> eat green apple slices. Good to know. Yeah. Okay. Any other tips from Nightwing? Like, if, if Nightwing were to give us a tip right now on the carpet about Son of Batman, about what we can expect from the Nightwing oh, character, what wow. would he share? Um, oh gosh, I don't know. Uh, you're in for quite a ride, <laughs> and not my fault. <laughs> Gotcha. And then finally, a favorite element of just creating the film. A favorite element? Mm -hmm. um, I think just being in the booth and, and bringing the character to life. And um, When I was there, we, I had a picture of Nightwing on a music stand right in front of me. So just sort of looking at him and, and sort of trying my best to kind of, you know, translate as best he would. That would be my favorite element. That's yeah. Okay, so Miss Romano, congratulations on yet another feat here with the Son of Batman. What did you bring to this film that was different than any of the others that you've done? We've had very few of these that had children as a main character. And I love working with real kids, I really do. And this young actor is so wonderful. He came in for his audition in his wonderful fedora, so styling, but this confidence and this strength that was so crucial for the role. And I, I loved working with him. Not only was he right for the role, but he had ideas of his own. Andrea, how about if we, okay, let's try that, Stuart. I know, I know. He's, he's like, what, 14 going on 40. Yep. <laughs> Whoa, that's so much confidence that comes on in. And it's funny because you have such a cool cast of people as well because our actor who portrays Nightwing, he said that this was, uh, he comes from a singing background. So how did you use those skills, pull those skills that he already had as a trained singer and help to translate those into something that would work in this? The, the thing about on-camera actors, I, I always go number one for a good actor. A good actor. And I love Sean's work and I was determined to always, to at some point in my career, use every actor from Firefly. So it's just a matter of finding the right role for Sean. And then because he's a singer, he has microphone technique. He's been in front of a microphone. He understands I didn't have to teach him how to not pop, how to, to deal with mouth noise. He knows all that because of his vocal work doing singing work. Gotcha. He also mentioned something about green apple slices yeah. being used. Yes, when, when the, the mouth clicks, when there's extra saliva in the mouth, an easy way to get rid of that, especially if you're recording in the morning, is to eat a little bit of green apple and it just takes it away. Learned it from singers. Learned it from singers. Fantastic. We're going to take that tip along with us. Thank you so much, Mr. Romano. appreciate you. you. Thank you. Okay, so Phil, when it came down to designing the characters for Son of Batman, what's the feeling that you wanted to evoke? Um, I guess Batman is one of those characters that, you know, for every artist, it's a milestone when you get to work on that character. Um, for the last five years, I've been kind of the Justice League guy from all my work at Warner Brothers. Even Young Justice was basically a team show. So I was really looking forward to just working on the Batman mythos. Um, that being said, he's a character who's like has so much range, you know, with how you can depict him. Um, so I already kind of knew what my take was going to be. Also knowing who was going to animate it, the uh, really talented Answer Studio in Japan. So I already have some anime influences in my style and I kind of looked at what they do and what their strengths are and I just pushed more, a little more into that realm to find a comfort zone that we could all work in. And yeah, I just went for something that I felt was going to be classic, you know, a classic take on the character but still, you know, moving forward with this sort of new look and it's, I don't know, you know, I was trying to really um, just appreciate that moment. Any day that you can you know, go to work and get paid to draw Batman is a good day, so. For sure. Yeah. And finally, then, with all of that said, can you look at this poster for us right now and, and tell us one thing in here that the average eye might not pick up on, but that you would love for us to be able to pick up on? Um, okay. Well, this is a little bit of a spoiler, but once you see the movie, it won't be. Um, basically, all that gear that Damien is wearing uh, he starts out as like a ninja, right? Because he's, he's trained by the League of Shadows and his grandfather, Ra's al Ghul. Basically, he takes some of that gear, like the ninja gauntlets and the greaves, and he kind of turns them into uh, an aspect of his Robin costume. So he doesn't lose all the ninja stuff when he takes the costume. He kind of takes Dick Grayson's old outfit and combines elements from his ninja background and he creates this hybrid, you know, Robin sort of ninja outfit. So you'll see elements like even the hood that he's wearing, he actually cuts that up and he makes it part of the cape. Yeah, so there's little elements like I don't know if fans will catch it because we, we were going to do a scene, a scene that got cut ultimately where you show him like taking the, the ninja outfit and sort of combining it, but it didn't end up in the film. So 
basically if you look out for it, you'll see that he's wearing those gauntlets and greaves and then he kind of paints them green and, and it ends up in his Robin outfit. So that's a little something. Dude, Little, that's that's more insight than we expected you to share with us right here. Thank you so much, Phil. Appreciate you. We'll share you with the rest. Yeah, right. All right, cool. okay. All right. Uh, yeah, I'm James Tucker, producer of Son of Batman, and it's T U C K E R. <laughs> Thank you so much. So, when it came to Son of Batman, what was it about this project that yelled out to you? This is something that I want to produce. Um. Well, you know, having worked on Batman a lot over the years. Um, we wanted a story that was fresh, that hadn't been told before, that um, brought out an aspect of Batman that fans haven't really seen. And I mean fans who aren't, not all, just comic book fans, although of course they're our primary audience, but people who have a casual knowledge of Batman. The idea that he has a son really resonates, I think, with anybody. And it's just such a strong idea. And Damien is such a great character that, uh, it was kind of a no-brainer to kind of introduce him as the first character in this new line of Batman stories and explore Batman from the angle of being a parent and having to deal with his offspring in a way that he can't with some of his other uh, disciples. So um, it um, opened a lot of story opportunities for us. In fact, it probably opened so many that it was it a difficult thing in order to narrow down exactly what angles do we want to explore within this this film that can only be but so long because there's so much with the father and son that you can do right well we wanted to get the gist of the relationship and um, you know see how this movie went and then for you know hopefully further explore it um, but yeah we couldn't literally adapt the first storyline because just too unwieldy and long and um, and it kind of ended on a open note so um and also you know the the needs of a movie we kind of needed Damien a little bit redeemed at the end he's not totally redeemed by any means whereas the first arc of you know Batman and Son he's still pretty much a little s-word so uh so we you know we we made some took some liberties but um, I think it's an enjoyable film I think it gives you the essence of Damien it's clear we know who the character is. It's not like, you know, some Hollywood guy just took a comic book and totally screwed it up. We know who the character is. So, you know, there's, we always have to make choices. So I'm really happy with what we did with it. And I think for this continuity, it's its own thing. And the way we're using Damien, I think fans will enjoy. Well, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Yeah, man. Have a great one. <laughs> this film. How did you bring something fresh to it that you hadn't brought to any of your other projects before? Um, I think just being it being Batman, I was able to bring a lot with uh, it's so much to work with. It's a great character and I think we added a little film noir to it and I think we added a little bit of the classic pulp elements to it. After it was done I was like, wow this is kind of pulpy, I like it, like old fashioned a little bit. So. And how do you infuse the film with that sort of pulpiness? Is it within the script or is it solely within the animation style? How do you get that in? It's in both. It's in the script and then in the, the shots that we chose and the lighting. It's very dark. A lot of it takes place at night. So we were able to embrace like the film noir, which, he, which Batman is great in that anyway. So, so I think that was going for us. So I think we had a good, a good mix of stuff in there. I think there's, a, there's ninjas in it, there, you know, mad scientist, Langstrom. So it's, it's, it's good. There's a lot of stuff in it. Everybody loves ninjas, so you can't go wrong with the ninjas. We're bringing ninjas back. <laughs> the 80s are coming back. There they go. <laughs> um, so also, as a director for an animated feature, I know that for a lot of us, it's kind of, uh, it, it's a new concept, and a new idea for us to understand it. what does, what role does a director play when you're not directing physical bodies moving around? So can you give us some insight into that? Yeah, it's a little bit of the same, but just with drawings. It's like, we work with a team of storyboard artists, You'll get, they each have a sequence from the script, and they're required to draw out almost like a comic strip, you know. And then I, it's my job to go over it and make sure the acting is right, and like, if Bruce Wayne would be standing like this, or, and that's the thing with Bruce, Batman, it's like, he doesn't emote a lot, so he, he has to be really restrained. So if you get a drawing where he's too emotive, you're like, ah, oh, Batman, he wouldn't make that face. It's like, you just have to make him neutral you know so stuff like that and we wanted to keep Damien um, not as just a typical kid so we made sure in all the poses of the storyboard to make him like a man like he's a little Bruce Wayne so he's real confident when he stands he's not he's not just like 
a bratty kid, you know, so. Stuff like that. And we get to see some of that right here in this poster. Yeah, yeah he's crazy. Watch out. <laughs> no, he's great. He's a great character. So I think uh, I, he came out really well, so I'm, I'm happy with it. So. Do these gargoyles play any role within the film? Uh, oh, the man bats. Oh, man bats. Yeah, yeah, man bats. Langstrom's in it. Um, there's a serum. He's making man bats for um, Deathstroke. So he's making an army um, of these mutant ninja mutant hybrids. So these guys have swords and Damien and Batman have to fight them. So this is so awesome. We can't wait. A little part of this, the story. So May 6th, we can't wait to get into it. Thank you so much, sir. Appreciate it. We'll do. So <laughs> uh, I'm Xander Berkeley and I voice Dr. Langstrom. Great. So what for those of us who are new to the Batman universe, specifically the son of Batman, who is the doctor? Um, well, you know, you, you expect uh, the, the villain, but uh, then you discover that his, his daughter's been held hostage. and So he has uh, been held captive by the real villain, and so things work out in the end. So then when you were preparing for this role, getting ready to step into the booth, what sort of mental gymnastics did you have to jump into to be ready? Well, I've been playing bad guys for a very, very long time, and I've been playing professors and doctors and things like that for a long time as well. And uh, I, th I think I got the call from uh, Andrea to see if I was available while I was working on something else, and I was free that day, so I jumped in. That's the <laughs> honest truth. But, uh, but you know, you, you, the, the beauty is with animation, you read it, and as long as you've read it before, then you read it with all the other actors there as opposed to having to memorize it, which takes more time and when you're going in front of the camera. It's kind of like reader's theater. You yeah, know? it is. Yeah. It's like radio theater. It's great.